very eminent speaker in the field of sickle cell disease, uh, Professor Dr. Frempong. Uh, talk will be about the recent advances in the management of sickle cell disease. Thank you very much. And I truly want to thank Professor Bestavi, whom I've known for many, many years, uh, for inviting me to be here to share uh, a little bit of the new knowledge about sickle cell disease with you. My work is actually made easier because I was just li listening to Dr. Sheikh Musa and uh, as he was going through all the new drugs and their effects, uh, that gives me a little bit of uh, less work to do. I'm also very proud to say that he's working with one of my mentees at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, a young man from Nigeria who has been working with us for more than 15 years. So this is great. Well, the sickle cell disease is a very well-known uh, disease. Uh, it's been around for probably a few thousand years, but it wasn't discovered until um, a young man uh, of African origin, a uh, student from Grenada came to U.S. to study in Chicago and showed up at Presbyterian Hospital in Chicago in December two, uh, 1904 with symptoms of a disorder that had not been described uh, up to that point. Uh, the, paper, the paper from that um, visit was published by uh, Dr. James Herrick and who got famous as the uh, first person uh, to describe, at least with modern uh, literature, uh, sickle cell disease. The work that was published actually belonged to his resident, um, a young doctor called um, Irons, N.S. Irons, who was, the, was in the emergency room when the patient showed up. And this is the note that he wrote on December 31st, um, 19. Four, where he drew at the bottom corner there what the red cells looked like. Uh, he moved on as a resident and years after he saw the patient, actually six years later, the paper was published. He was mentioned uh, in the paper. He himself uh, became a famous doctor and became president of the American Medical Association at some point. But both of them never worked in sickle cell disease. Often we are asked where the term sickle cell disease came from. And around the same time in 1905, a pathologist, a German pathologist working in uh, Austria, in Innsbruck, actually had published a paper describing some red cells that he had seen in a patient that was assumed to have leukemia. He didn't know the patient, but the samples, uh, the slides had been sent to him. And he described that he saw these sickle forms uh, on, this, on the smear of this uh, patient. And we know that that's where the word sickle came from because Dr. Herrick, who wrote the paper was also searching for whether anybody had seen that paper and he happened to be told about this uh, paper from uh, Innsbruck and these are the notes from uh, Dr. Herrick that shows clearly that he borrowed the term sickle uh, from Dr. Van Lewitt who described um, these cells. Uh, people in Africa when I tell them that the cells actually look like banana on, on the smear, they say that we should have called it banana cells so that it'd be more popular because most people don't know what a sickle is. But this is more than 100 years ago now. We've learned a lot about this disease. We know about the genetics of it. We know a lot about uh, the pathophysiology of it. But it's only in the last 20, 25 years that there has been very strong interest in developing specific treatment for sickle cell disease. And this is what I hope uh, I can speak about very briefly. I want to talk a little, bit, a little bit about some of the new information about the origins of the disease, um, some new ways of diagnosing dis the disease rapidly, uh, drug development, you already heard a lot about it from Professor Musa, um, and I will talk a little bit about um, where we are in the disease modifying therapy. Also I know that you've had an excellent talk on gene therapy, and I don't have much to say about that except for a few things. So about 35 years ago, we learned about the uh, different origins, we thought, of sickle cell disease. And we've described it as a genetic event, which is exactly the same mutation that occurred in at least five different places on Earth. And this was based on uh, studies of the uh, beta globin gene, uh, the region surrounding the beta globin gene, and the different polymorphisms that were seen in different populations. 
that led to the classification of what was thought to be separate origins of exactly the same mutation. So at least five areas on Earth were described as having uh, been uh, sources of the same mutation. And based on the uh, places where the samples were drawn, we now described in the literature Benin haplotype, uh, Central African Republic or Bantu haplotype, the Senegal haplotype, the India Arab haplotype, and then a small tribe in Cameroon uh, seemed to have a different origin that uh, became the Cam Cameroon haplotype. But anything in science, whatever you think you learn, you continue to, continue to look for more information about it, and then people begin to develop doubts. And so, not long ago, um, a paper was published. Uh, this is March last year. And the idea is not entirely new. There have been at least three publications that doubted the idea of separate origins of, of the uh, sickle cell gene. One of the things that is unique is that um, the substitution of valine for glutamic acid in the hemoglobin uh, molecule that differed um, hemoglobin S from hemoglobin A. That particular substitution, which is a, on the gene, is a GAG codon that codes for glutamic acid that changed to a GTG, an A to T change. It is not the only change that could have resulted in valine being substituted for glutamic acid. But everybody in the world who has sickle cell disease seems to have exactly the same mutation. That sort of makes you wonder whether, in fact, they are not all related. And this study uh, that was published by Shrina and uh, Rotimi, Rotimi is, by, by the way, a Nigerian who's been working in, uh, circles, uh, at the NIH for quite a few years, uh, clearly showed that if you looked at the entire genome and not just the um, part of the um, globin gene on, on chromosome uh, 11, that you will see that in fact, the sickle mutation dates farther back that had been uh, uh, thought. So now we are back to what was suspected many, many years ago, that the gene originated somewhere in the, um, in the Middle East and then spread around the world. But now this uh, has placed the gene in West Africa. And so we can comfortably say that everybody in the world who has sickle cell disease actually has the same uh, ancestor, and that the ancestor is somewhere in West Africa. The only thing that is interesting about it is not so much um, just that it started in many places. It, it, it just means that some of the changes that we have ascribed to the different haplotypes actually may have either occurred after the uh, mutation or may have occurred as people moved uh, around the world. When mixtures of people occur, sometimes you don't inherit just one gene by itself, but you may in inherit other genetic events that may make a pathology actually appear milder. So we know that some uh, people with sickle cell disease may have more fetal hemoglobin than others, and that may make their disease uh, become a little modified. Also, this means that if you engineer a solution, a gene therapy solution, especially a gene editing solution for sickle cell disease, the same event, the same solution should apply to everybody in the world who has sickle cell disease because the mutation is exactly the same and the background to it seems to be the same. Okay, to move on, how about diagnosis of sickle cell disease? This is an area where things haven't changed for many, 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 many years. Uh, the number of times that I say hemoglobin electrophoresis makes me feel somewhat ashamed that for all these decades, we have not come up with anything, even though we know that electrophoresis is a very limited uh, test that is only able to distinguish uh, a few variants of hemoglobin uh, uh, variants that we know are in the world. Here, this, I think, I checked uh, the HBVAR sites uh, back in June or so, and, and this is continually changing because people are discovering new hemoglobins all the time, that there are more than 1,300 structural variants of the common hemoglobins that we have. There are more than 490 mutational events that result in thalassemia. There are about 50 events that result in both. And then there are the defects that are related to heme synthesis. So my idea is that this is probably what genetic disease is all about. There's just so much variation uh, that uh, leads to human uh, disease that it cannot be only with hemoglobins, that there are so many variations. We don't have any simple tests that can distinguish most of these um, 
uh, together. And so the tests that we use are in, in, inadequate in many ways. They have to be simple enough so that they can be applied in many, many solutions. But often when we interpret the tests, we interpret them as if they are very, very definitive. 70% of abnormal hemoglobins co-migrate with hemoglobin A on our common electrophoretic uh, techniques. So every time we do electrophoresis or similar tests and we say hemoglobin A, we should always have a little bit of discomfort that what we describe as A may actually not be A. There is not a single hemoglobin uh, variant that is the only one that migrates uh, electrophoretically in any of the tests that we have. So we should keep that in mind. Well, recently, people have been trying to see if we can find even simpler ways uh, to make uh, these diagnoses because they affect so many millions of people in so many different uh, clinical situations that it's always been felt that if we had simpler tests that can be used in large-scale screening, we may be able to find those who have disease that need to be monitored. And in the last seven to eight years, the point of care tests uh, have been under development. Initially um, stimulated by the NIH when it gave some grants uh, through their small business uh, initiative program for some companies to start developing point of care tests that will be applicable in low resource uh, settings. Uh, before that, the NIH had sent, or the NHLB uh, had sent around uh, some um, requests for information for many people asking them whether it would make sense to try to have simpler tests, less expensive tests that can be used mostly in developing countries. So about uh, seven uh, companies have been working on this. One of them actually started on its own without NIH funding. I just want to give you, I think, three examples of, of where that uh, point of care test development is going. Um, because of work done in HIV, WHO had actually uh, started developing some criteria uh, for what a, a, a point of care test that would be very good for developing countries would be. And it's called the assured uh, criteria. That the test should be affordable, because if it's too expensive, most poor people around the world cannot afford it. Ideally, it should be less than a dollar. But people find less than $5 somewhat acceptable, although many people cannot afford that. It should be sensitive, so that we don't have a lot of false uh, negatives, because then we will miss some people who need therapy. It should also be specific, because if it's not specific and there are too many false positives, then you can't really rely on it. Uh, to take clinical action. It should be user-friendly, simple to perform, should not require uh, extensive training of the uh, test uh, performer. Uh, if the person has to have a lot of technical training, that alone would make it also somewhat uh, expensive to uh, institute. It should be rapid, that the test should be done in front of the person. If they have to send sample to a lab, uh, and get results days later, then it's really not, uh, may not be very useful. As much as possible, it should not require the purchase of extra equipment. And that could be even simpler things like refrigeration, all of those things, the power source, all of that, uh, if they're eliminated, it would make uh, the, the, the test much better to use in developing countries. And it should be delivered to those who need it. They don't have to go far away to get to the test, meaning that it should be where the patient is. So a number of these tests are trying to uh, meet this. And uh, two or three of them are rapidly uh, gaining use. Uh, two of them are lateral flow immunoassays. So they, they use antibodies to hemoglobins as the way to identify the hemoglobins. That alone makes them somewhat limited because the more specific an antibody is, the, the, the fewer the um, antigens that they will be able to uh, detect. So in hemoglobins, when you have so many variants, uh, you can't put that many antibodies in any test to, to discover many, many things. So you're limited by what you can do. Uh, one of them is called Sickle Scan, it's developed by a company in the U.S. called Biomedomics. They are based in a research triangle, and they were not funded initially by NIH. So they have been actually started selling uh, this uh, test, which is it's a sandwich type uh, re, um, lateral flow immunoassay. Uh, so the, the whole machine is built on this hard plastic uh, format that has a membrane in it uh, on which um, 
antibodies are embedded uh, in a linear fashion on streaks and the antibody tries to detect antigens that are in the blood that is being tested. So three antibodies are developed, actually four. Uh, there's hemoglobin A ant uh, antibody, hemoglobin S, and hemoglobin C. And as a control, they also made antibodies against the alpha globin gene. Since all these hemoglobins require alpha globin gene, just to see if the test is working, uh, you have the control uh, media, which is anti um, alpha globin uh, gene, uh, anti alpha globin antibody. Uh, so this test depends on a color that is developed when the antigen and the antibody complex. Then a blue color uh, develops in the lane where that particular antibody is embedded. So the first uh, lane that you see on your left says hemoglobin AA, where there are two bands there. The top one is the control, and the second one is the location of hemoglobin A. I can see only one hemoglobin uh, band, so, but they say AA, which tends to mean that they have information that suggests that this is a homozygous condition. But like all hemoglobin separation tests, you cannot make the assumption of homozygosity when you only see one protein that is being made. So there are controls that they use for the test, they kept repeating that those people are AA. So the person with one A band, as you can understand, may have A beta zero thalassemia, may have A beta plus thalassemia, or may have AX, X being a hemoglobin for which they don't have an antibody. So they only see what they predict. They only see one hemoglobin band. You cannot talk about the hom homozygosity when you are only seeing uh, one thing, but almost all of these tests tend to do that. The second one says AS. So the upper band is the control. Then there's a slightly fainter band in the position of A. And then there's the, a darker band in the position of S. When I showed this to my uh, genetic counselor, she said, this is S beta plus thalassemia. Because she's trained uh, by electrophoresis where the intensity of what you see corresponds to concentration. But in this test, the intensity is actually determined by the avidity of the antibody to the antigen. So in fact, at this point, they were using a polyclonal antibody, uh, and the one for hemoglobin A was much weaker at binding hemoglobin A than the one for hemoglobin S. So the S always looked darker than the A. So if you had been trained to look at intensity and make inference on relative quantity, in this test, uh, you would be wrong. The same thing with S. One S band is interpreted as SS. And then the, the, the last one is SC. At least the SC seems to uh, make sense. So the fact that it, you only see what you have, you don't even see fetal hemoglobin. Uh, and if you test young children, many of us will be quite unhappy that we don't see the predominant hemoglobin in, in, in newborns or, or, or infants. No fetal hemoglobin antibodies on this test. But it is simple, and if all you're interested in diagnosing is um, the presence of A or S, uh, that's, that's fine, and C. But the homozygosity report is, uh, has to be ignored. A similar test is hemotype SC. Uh, that also is uh, uh, an immunoassay, and it has a very unique uh, uh, feature. While the other one is just a straight lateral flow uh, with antibodies, this one is actually a competitive um, immunoassay. So the sample is mixed with antibody. The sample is mixed with antibody to the hemoglobins. And the membrane on which they're traveling then binds it when there is anti, uh, uh, antibody antigen complexing in a particular lane. So when they are competing, it is the antibody that is labeled. But the patient's hemoglobin is not labeled, so it is competing with the labeled antibody. So it is excluding the labeled antibody. So this is a competitive assay. So unlike everything where we see what we believe, this one, it is what you don't see that is there. You understand it? Yes. It competes with the labeled antibody. So if that hemoglobin is there, then it denies the antibody the chance to uh, match 
with, with the um, embedded uh, antigen, and so you don't see it. Most people who see this for the first time will make an error. They will read what they see, not what they don't see, because that's how we've been trained. So even though the training is not extensive, many people uh, make a mistake with this particular test. And so we think the development of it takes some use to, uh, to, to, to see that. So the first lane, for instance, there's a position for hemoglobin A that is blank. That means the person has hemoglobin A. And the other lanes are lighting up because there was no competition against them. And, and, and so are the others. So it's a little difficult to understand. This is a very interesting uh, machine. It's called the Heme Chip, made by a company called Hemex. Uh, they are in Oregon, uh, US. And that requires a small machine. Uh, so it's not as simple. And this small machine has a battery in it that re is rechargeable in the same way that you would charge your phone. It uses a very simple uh, charging system, but it, is, it requires external electricity. So it's basically using a cellulose acetate electrophoresis format on a microchip that is then read by this uh, machine. So the separations on the, on the uh, picture on the right are very similar to what you get in a cellulose acetate at alkali pH, the same sort of separations. Because this is not antibody dependent, you have the opportunity to see many different variants. But you also know that cellulose acetate electrophoresis is limited in, in how, much, how many hemoglobins it can resolve. So for instance, S and D and G will migrate in the same area. C and A2 and E will migrate in the same area. So the same uh, limitations of electrophoresis can be seen in this. But this machine does something else also. It has built into it uh, a system for quantitating the hemoglobins using uh, a scanning uh, program that is actually using mobile phones. It's built into the machine, so it's not only giving you the different types of hemoglobins, it gives you the relative percentages. That makes it a lot more useful, not just for screening, but also in clinical applications, such as you transfuse patients, you want to know how much A and S they have. Uh, also, it can give you an idea of who may have beta plus thalassemia, uh, if you have more S than A, it will give you the percentages. It is not doing very well at the very low percentages, but they're still uh, working on it. They have just added a twist to this machine that makes it even more attractive. It can give you hemoglobin concentration. So in addition to typing hemoglobin, it can actually tell you whether the person is anemic. And even more interestingly, they have made a chip in there for detecting malaria also a rapid test for malaria. So this, te this machine can tell you whether somebody has malaria, whether they are anemic, and also whether they have sickle cell uh, disease or different variants. So it's very promising. It's not on the market yet, but they're still uh, working on uh, trying to perfect it. So it's a very interesting development. So those we think, those machines can have a much broader uh, use in, in uh, poor countries, in settings, where, as we speak, there are many, many children who are sick and going to see a doctor and whose sickle cell status is not known. And some of them will be sent away from the doctor with ear infection or malaria, and they will die a day or two later, and people would not know that that person actually had uh, sickle cell disease. So we think that some of these tests may be very useful. Now, we've heard about drug development. You know, up until hydroxyurea was uh, licensed, in, I think in 1998, we had no drug. No drug had been licensed for the treatment of sickle cell disease. And I remember in 2010, when we had the first Global Congress on Sickle Cell Disease, a parent who was at the time leading the team from uh, Brazil to Ghana made the comment that here we've had 100, and, and 100 years of scientific uh, knowledge about sickle cell disease, a disease that has taught us a lot, and we did not have we only had one drug that had been uh, licensed for sickle cell disease. It's changing, and it's changing so rapidly that it's hard to actually keep up with it. Now we have a second drug that has been licensed, at least in the US, L-glutamine, and Dr. Shaker mentioned uh, that you. So now we have two drugs that have been licensed and are on the market for sickle cell disease. L-glutamine, even though it's a common amino acid, and you know many people get it in food health, uh, food, um, what do we, health food stores, this L-glutamine, which is 
pharmaceutical grade L-glutamine is actually very expensive. And the cost of it alone is making it prohibitive for uh, some uh, patients to be able to apply. I think that after time, uh, the market forces alone will tell them to come down. But it's been proven in uh, phase three trials that it does reduce uh, the frequency of, of pain and other complications in sickle cell disease and, and probably also improves uh, hemoglobin. I'll run through very quickly. Thank you. So now the list is getting longer. Um, you heard about the different drugs that are uh, in the pipeline. I won't spend time with that, but three of them have just been moved recently forward by at least US FDA. Um, GM1-1070, which is Rivipansol, is one of the anti-adhesive uh, medications that are in, in, in progress right now. This one is a pan-selecting and reduces uh, cell ad ad adhesion. And it is planned to be used for when the patient has pain. So it's for treatment. That's how it's been tried in clinical trials. It's not a preventive uh, medication. For, for, when the patient is sick, it's when you use it. I think many of us clinicians uh, would like to think that once somebody has already started having pain, uh, particularly they are coming in front of you, they may have had pain for several days at home before coming uh, to the hospital. So something that prevents pain may be more attractive. But this uh, is a very promising drug, and it's been given um, um, permission or fast track permission by FDA for large scale uh, clinical uh, phase three trials. SEG 101 or Crizanlizumab is another one in the same uh, vein. It is a P-selecting inhibitor, uh, but this one is designed to be a preventive agent. It's given once a month. And in the clinical trials, uh, it also seemed to be able to reduce the frequency uh, of pain. GBT4, uh, 440 or Voxelotol, uh, you've heard about it. This is the one that shifts the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve to the left uh, so that you, uh, the hemoglobin S retains more oxygen on it and doesn't polymerize easily. Uh, this one too is undergoing a uh, fast track. Here is a list of the different types of agents and the number of drugs that are being uh, tried. I can't go through all of them, but this is for me, it's sort of glorifying that in sickle cell disease now, we have more than 40, uh, 50 drugs that are being uh, test by, uh, tested by different companies. And out of these, we may not have something that has as broad a value as, say, hydroxyurea, but I think most of us think that sickle cell disease is going to be treated with multiple agents, not just a single agent. In fact, in many of these clinical trials, about half the patients are on, allowed to be on hydroxyurea. It's almost become unethical to do a clinical trial on sickle cell disease where the patients are on only placebo and not clinical trial. That the only ones to go on placebo may be those who have failed hydroxyurea. So now we may be um, helping patients with more than one agent, hydroxyurea plus or plus plus something else. Very quickly about the disease modifying therapy that we are all very familiar with. We ha nothing has really changed about chronic transfusion therapy. It is still probably the most common uh, treatment for preventing of specific serious complications like stroke uh, or patients who have had repeated acute chest syndrome. Hydroxyurea has not done as well in preventing stroke or as well as preventing acute chest syndrome. So chronic transfusion therapy still has a place. And for patients, children with abnormal TCD in areas where transfusion therapy is possible, that is preferred to hydroxyurea. But in low, set, uh, um, low resource settings where chronic transfusion is not possible, hydroxyurea may be second best for preventing primary uh, stroke. Uh, now we are expanding the use of hydroxyurea. It is not a pediatric preventive drug. And the FDA in the US, rec I mean near the FDA, NHLBI recommended that children from nine months of age should be offered hydroxyurea. And the protocols we are developing in Ghana, the starting uh, doses, uh, starting treatment is at one year. Gene therapy and, and um, bone marrow transplantation, I don't have to say much about it. So I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Frempong, for the comprehensive um, lecture.